What's up, fellas? What you're looking at here is a electro refining, electro whining machine. It can do both at the same time, actually. But we're going to be doing some testing on this thing with electro refining to start. And I just wanted to get a quick uh, GoPro overview of this thing because it's a little bit better of a camera and there's a lot to look at here. So this thing is pretty freaking awesome. Let's check it out and see just what in the heck is going on here. Pretty uh, cool little machine. We're coming up to temp. We're gonna hit 140 degrees Fahrenheit and we're gonna stop there. And we're gonna run this thing for a couple of hours. And we're gonna look for even the slightest little leak. One drip will cause action to take place to repair it. We did have one drip, but we got that fixed and uh, we're about ready to get our wheels off the ground here. I'm doing a little bit of uh, flow path observation work here. Just thought I'd bring you in and show you what's going on because it's kind of cool. Um, what I've done here is I've lowered the amount of fluid in the reservoir tank see we're steaming hot there man that diffuser is just working amazing i'm so glad that worked out so anyway what's going on is now that the diffuser is so far above the water level we're getting bubbles and trained into the flow can't really see them there but they show up beautifully in the cell here i hope you can pick this up But this allows me to observe the flow path in the cell. You can see bubbles getting sucked right into the anode there. I don't know how well this is going to turn up. But bubbles are going directly into the anode. I don't know if we can get it bottom shot of that. Probably not. But. The flow isn't bad. There is constant movement there. Not a whole lot of eddy currents, really. We don't want to see a bunch of just spinning rotation. I'm going to change the valve settings now. I'm going to close this valve all the way, which is going to force all of the fluid through the anode. And that will then have to pass up through here. This is the current flow rate we have going through the anode. That light's probably drowning you out. And this is the total flow rate into the system. Kind of hard to see what's going on when you're you got that tunnel vision going. Okay, so I'm gonna close the valve all the way and hopefully we'll get a real good look at what's going to happen as a result. And the valve is closed. It definitely seemed to cause a more desirable flow pattern in my opinion. We're seeing a end to those eddy currents. Maybe with the zoom on, we can see it better. We'll look at both with this zoom in place. Because I really don't know what you're able to see. Not a whole lot of fluid flying into that anode, but a little bit nonetheless. Okay, now I'm going to... Oh, let's take a look at the flows. definitely increase the flow going through that anode for about nine liters a minute there this thing's under a little bit of pressure I would imagine this is about 35 psi it seems uh 
when you crack that valve to let fluid out, it really rolls, man. Okay, now I'm gonna open the valve all the way. And we'll see what happens with the valve open all the way. It's open. A lot more overall flow is taking place now, but I'm not sure how much of it ends up where we want it to go. I'm almost thinking I might want to put a bottom connection on this to give us a swirling effect. Kind of a lingering effect there. So I'm going to try a half valve now and see what that can do for us. Right about there seems to get that anode ball rattling. As soon as I see that rattling is where I stop the valve this time. That has a really nice flow to it right there. I hope you guys are picking this up. Okay, so I think we much, pretty much figured out that that valve likes to live right there. So pretty cool how that worked out. I'm going to go ahead and dump this gallon of water back into the reservoir. I removed it so that I could get those bubbles and trained in the flow. But I don't like that for the most part. That can cause cavitation in our pumps. And it can also cause restriction and flow if large pockets of bubbles form in the plumbing somewhere or something. So I'm gonna try and avoid that. All right, fellas, I got some explaining to do here. Um, you're gonna love this. Now, I've been blessed with an extremely intelligent fan base. I'm talking academics, chemists, physicists, professors, very, highly educated people and some of you may have scoffed at my cavitation remark that I just made well I want to clarify here I'm not talking about the type of destructive cavitation that can damage impellers I'm talking about the type of cavitation that involves the air bubbles and trained in the flow become exponentially larger because of the vacuum induced by the sucking action of the pump and this can inhibit the performance of the pump significantly so no i'm not talking about cavitation the type that causes implosions that eat away at the impeller um, i know that's probably not possible when you have entrained gas so i'm not talking about the cavitation that pulls gas out of solution i'm talking about the type of cavitation that expands the, the size of the air bubbles entrained in the flow, thereby reducing the efficiency of the pump. Because if you have space occupied by an artificially inflated bubble that could have been occupied by water, you're obviously losing something. So just had to stop you from beating me to death in the comments there, fellas. Forgive me. Unfortunately, this anode bag had some kind of soap on it or something, and that's what we see there. That little bit of a detergent looking action going on. Probably ain't gonna be able to see it. All right. I had a, a minor drip, like one drip every 10 minutes coming out of this port here, but I completely swapped it out. I just went ahead and chopped the whole thing off and I got these metal constituents out of the system now. And I just went with uh, the CPVC. And I used CPVC um, primer and glue to just glue directly to this PVC. And I did the same thing here, CPVC glued to PVC threads. These are threaded right here. It's not just to slide together. And I initially had started out with uh, this metal here and I was afraid to tighten it too much because you're going into plastic and you can break the 
the um, union, so or the adapter, I should say. And I use this stuff here, and that, that one little drip is just unacceptable when you're working with an acid. So while I was in there, I went ahead and changed this out to a CPVC glue versus the uh, Teflon or the pipe dope. Same thing down here, because I didn't want the same thing to happen. It's holding out everywhere else. I wasn't afraid to tighten these a lot here. I went ahead and cranked them down real good. Same thing with this. These can handle quite a bit. It's just these adapter fittings are very thin plastic and they're very easy to break. And I've had it happen before, like six months into operation of the machine, one of these things busted on us, man. It was just a, a nightmare. So I, I went ahead and just glued it and uh, we do not have any drips anywhere. Any of these little drips you see here are from me lifting this up. It's got condensation all over it. We're running at 135 degrees. And it's going to keep on continuing to rise till it reaches 140. And if you haven't seen the first video on this machine, um, we are running this heating element. This is a copper jacketed heating element for a simple hot water heater. Nothing special about it. I got all this stuff at Menards. But because it had that copper jacket, I felt it could withstand the acid. Some of them have like a, I don't know if it's stainless steel or not. I wasn't taking a chance. It looked galvanized, but I doubt it. We have that being run by a solid state relay, which is being controlled by this PID controller. In addition to that, we have the heating element connected to this 10,000 watt triac circuit, which is essentially a type of router speed controller is what they're listed as when you go to buy them. Um, and the reason for that is it enables us to run this system at 1200 watts versus 2000 watts. Rather than this thing turning on at 2000 watts and then kicking off when the power is, uh, or when the temperature is reached, it will run at about 1000 watts to 900 watts, which is a little bit more relaxing to the system. And the reason that's important is, is because when you go to set the voltage on this machine, every time that unit kicks on and pulls 2000 watts, the voltage drop overall is so significant it will alter the settings of this machine and you'll have to come back and tune it. Because I can't program a set voltage in, I can only set the voltage that will cause fluctuations in our electrolysis cell. So, just wanted to bust this out on GoPro.